Hey guys, I'm Richard. Uh, I'm a GP at One Confirmation, and that's actually not going to be quite the talk, title of my talk because I made this uh, the slides very last minute and finally figured out what I was going to talk about. Um, so this is my agenda. So first, I'll talk about kind of looking at historical projects that are successful and like what are common character traits of like looking at their Dune data, like what are patterns that you see of successful projects. Then I'll talk about like common pitfalls and like kind of what are things to watch, watch out and think about uh, when you look at Dune data and like context to think about. Uh, then I'll give a couple of hot takes and then looking at Dune data and then I'll leave it to Q&A. So first, uh, how to read Dune graphs. Um, so this is the general trend I see of um, projects, like successful projects, if you look at the Dune data, is um, first, like, they start out as like, really exponential growth, like 50% month over month. But like, the y-axis is still very tiny, which is why like, people on crypto Twitter and like, others just kind of write off this space or this project, because it's just kind of like rounding error and like, pennies for them. Um, then there's usually some catalyst that causes uh, that space in crypto to like, go like exponential and like vertical, and the graph just goes crazy. Um, and then like after the speculative frenzy, uh, you get a retracement from all-time high uh, back to like a new bottom. But the bo new bottom is higher than uh, where it started out from. And uh, eventually, you have like multiple of these like boom-bust cycles, and each floor is like higher than the previous um, floor. So, um, and I guess. Um, at one confirmation, we invest in seed stage. So the one caveat is uh, a lot of the stuff that I look at is still pre-products. So um, this only really applies to um, products that are live and have some traction that you can look at their Dune stuff. Um, so if, first good example I always like to use is Super Rare. So um, Super Rare actually started in April 2018. And this was back when the NFT space was like super tiny. And you know, most people wrote it off. Um, but actually, if you look at their data, like it was, even though the y-axis was super tiny, it was still growing about 50% month over month. And you know, as you can see, like throughout 2020, like they were still doing less than a million in uh, monthly volume. Um, but because of like the active growth in like volume and usage uh, across like all their KPIs, um, that's we noticed this trend and like decided to like pull the trigger on investing. Um, and like plus, they had a really robust community that was growing. And then, then came like kind of the NFT boom. Uh, this really peaked in uh, March 2021. This is when um, you know Beeple did that big sale um, with Christie's, and uh, NFTs were getting a lot of mainstream press attention, and like Super Rare as well, like all the other art marketplaces and OpenSea all really benefited from this, and like like volumes really like took off. And like in that month, I think it went over like 40 million in that month. Um, and so you had like the first boom bust cycle, and then you had like another one like late 2021, um, and things like kind of retraced back. But you know, if you see like the black line on the bottom graph, um, like the bottom that we are right now um, is still way higher than where Super Rare was um, like end of 2020. So like overall, like the state of the crypto art market is like much uh, more robust than it was uh, when Super Rare started. Um, so this is Super Rare. Um, OpenSea is another example. Um, where you know it was still like kind of largely under the radar as um, you know people were focused on DeFi summer yield farming, um, but there was a community of people uh, at, like trading and like flipping NFTs, and um, they had like the first bump uh, beginning of 2021 along with like the art market, which really catalyzed the NFT space. And then uh, around August 2021, that was when the loot mania happened, and like that was a kind of peak. Uh, like PFP flipping, and that's where OpenSea has like record high volume. Um, and obviously, uh, they can't keep that uh, speculative frenzy like forever. So you know things have retraced back since. But you know while everyone says that like OpenSea volume is like down 80, 90 percent from all time high, it's still like higher than it was um, before the big NFT boom. And like even like it's even higher than like the first NFT boom because it was like one in beginning of 21, and there's one like around Q3 of 21. So like OpenSea is like still in a good position, uh, even though like volumes down uh, from all time high. Um, and the last graph I want to show is uh, Nexus Mutual. Um, so this is a graph of their uh, active covers, um, which is like total amount of value being insured in DeFi um, and like custodian centralized exchanges. Um, so it was you know had like a kind of slow and steady upward growth, and 
um, things really started to pick up as uh, DeFi summer uh, yield farming took off around June, July 2020. Um, and you know, Nexus I see as like kind of an index bet on DeFi as TVL grows in DeFi, as the surface area of hacks grows, uh, Nexus is like really well uh, positioned to um, capture that. Um, and it was like until like February 2021 that like the graph just went vertical um, and like they reached all time highs like uh, for active covers. And then obviously things have come back down, but today they're still at around 200 million in active covers. Most of their purchasers are like family offices, institutions. Uh, I say like probably 90% of the users are such. Uh, and like that can make you know, $20 million cover buys all at once. And you know, as a result, like, um, the floor of like how much active covers there are is still much higher than it was when you know DeFi summer kicked off, when it was still largely like a retail degen phenomenon, and like now we have more gradually have more institutional adoption of DeFi, um, like people earning yield, like family offices, uh, fund of funds earning yield. Um, that's where Nexus um, is in a better spot than it was uh, when DeFi started, a uh, DeFi summer started. So like I guess uh, these three examples are a good kind of shows uh, the trends I see of like, successful projects and like, looking at their Dune data. Um, I do want to talk a bit about um, kind of common pitfalls or like, warnings that I see um, when looking at Dune charts and like, misconceptions when people share them on Twitter. So um, I guess unlike Web 2, Web 3 has like, these three features, um, Ponzi tokenomics, uh, yield farming, and you know, a lot of drama that's always on crypto Twitter. And I think that's, I think what's different about Web3 especially is um, there's a lot of, with tokens and like money involved, it's very easy to pay people to use your product. And I think people conflate that as like, just because you're paying people to use your product doesn't mean that you actually have product market fit. Um, and like, that's a really easy to do in Web3 versus Web2, where like, if you're a food delivery company, maybe you can have like, uh, discount codes and like, promo codes um, but that's not quite the same as like paying people like in yield farming to use their product. Um, so that really muddles the data when you look at uh, Dune stuff. Um, so you just always have to kind of keep that context in mind uh, when you're looking at Dune graph and it's going like kind of rocket ship up and to the right. Um, you have to make sure, okay, this is actually real usage, not just um, like inorganic usage from the project uh, paying for their usage. Um, so I'll give a few examples. So. Uh, starting with Ponzi tokenomics, uh, that's, I guess, hot take. That's generally how I feel about play to earn in general. Um, it's kind of like a Herbalife-esque business model, but like applying it to uh, Web3. And like a lot of that's already been written in like long tweet threads and like Substack medium articles about uh, Axie and like other play to earn games. So like, I won't really get into details there, but um, I guess like the one lesson to learn from this is uh, reflexivity works in both directions, and like that's what you have to remember when you're looking at a Ponzi graph. Is you know you might be just be looking at like one half of the graph when everything's like going up and to the right, uh, but then you have to remember like the circular tokenomics uh, can also spin the other way, and that's when things like really start cratering down. So you know when reflexivity was going up, when like things were all like rosy with like play to earn, um, you know you get a lot of uh, hot takes on Twitter saying that, like, uh, like, look, the PEs or, like, the fundamentals is so undervalued, uh, things like that. And, like, I remember when, like, Axie was even, um, had, like, better fundamentals than Ethereum L1 and, like, OpenSea. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, like, how sustainable is this? Uh, how much of this is just being propped up by tokenomics versus, like, real usage of the product? Um, and we saw this, like, later, a few months later, when, like, reflexivity started spiraling the other way down. And, um, now Axie is doing about you know, 11K in like, monthly revenue. Um, I think a big difference between like, Ponzi graphs and like, the graphs I showed earlier with like, OpenSea, Super, and Nexus is you know, when it kind of uh, bottoms out, like, Ponzi graphs kind of asymptote to zero uh, and like, never recover. Um, whereas like, projects that have real usage have like, sort of like a hard floor uh, where like, the floor is higher than like, the previous all-time high. And then it's kind of waiting for a, another macro catalyst uh, to like, have another boom in the space. Um, and this kind of reminds me of um, like, cryptocurrencies and ICOs. Is, you know, if, like, back in 2017, Ethereum had a floor of like, around 27, 2018. Like, Ethereum went from like, 1,400 down to like, 80 and had a floor of 80, whereas like, most ICOs from 2017 just kind of asymptoted to zero and like, never recovered. 
Um, so at the end of the day, you know, product, um, having actual product market fit at matters rather than just designing like a nice tokenomics uh, to kind of inflate the, uh, the KPIs of the graph. Um, so that's uh, one example. Uh, I guess the second one would be yield farming. And you know, there are a lot of uh, different like, case studies I can use for yield farming. Um, but like, kind of in essence, you know, paying people with tokens or kind of pseudo equity to use your product is not product market fit. Um, and I, I really like this um, tweet from Dan Robinson where you know, if, if you incentivize usage before you have product market fit, you're, you're basically flying blind. It's like you have no idea like, who your actual users are. Like, are people here mercenary because you're paying them, and are they just going to leave as soon as you turn the spigot off um, for like, yield incentives? Um, and you know, there's a lot of case studies I could use, but uh, here's one graph of uh, kind of the NFT uh, lending and borrowing space. Um, so as the blue um, part of the graph is uh, Ben Dow. And like the orange is NFT Fi. So like Ben Dow kind of came out of nowhere in the last few months and like started taking a lot of market share in the NFT collateralized lending and borrowing space. Um, which like you might think that's like, well, wow, they're just growing super fast. It's like great product market fit. Users love their product. Uh, until you dive into their docs and then realize that you know Ben Dow has the Ben token and they're allocating 40% of the token supply to incentivize uh, lending and borrowing. Which like once you learn that, then you kind of start to question, OK, how much of this is actual usage versus like paid inorganic usage? Um, so like Ben Dow is like one example. Like another example I could use is uh, Looks Rare. So um, there's, actually like two, oh, there's actually a really good, um, Hill Dobby made a really good uh, Dune dashboard on like Looks Rare with the wash trading filter. And it's like pretty ridiculous. Like if you turn on the wash trading filter, like the volumes of Looks Rare all go down like 98, 99%. And like most of that is just going to like six or so collections, like MeBits and others, um, where there's uh, no royalties. So you don't lose money um, from the royalty fees for like wash trading on LooksRare. Um, so like, I remember when a lot of people were looking at LooksRare and saying like, oh, this volume is like flipping OpenSea. Um, like we're going to have this decentralized uh, alternative to like the centralized NFT marketplace. When you realize that they were just incentivizing growth um, and you know, when the token price crashed and like they started cutting emissions of the token, then likewise, the usage and volume of LooksRare just kind of had a stair step um, downward trajectory uh, in sync with their token price and their emissions. Um, so that's yield farming. And um, last one I want to talk about is like this is more of like VC 101, where at, at the end of the day, like product and team matters. Um, and um, so, like with uh, th this example I'm using is uh, Sushi Swap. Um, so, like long term, uh, like you still need to innovate on product, and you can't just like copy what's working and like add a token to it and expect that to work long term. And you know this really hurt Sushi when uh, Uniswap launched V3, and as as a result, because V3 was much more capital efficient. Uh, liquidity and order flow just got aggregated and routed away to, uh, from Sushi to Uniswap because you could get a better uh, price and trade execution on uh, Uniswap. And you know, Sushi tried to copy that uh, with Trident. Uh, Trident was basically uh, Uni V3, Balancer, and Curve all kind of packaged together in one product. Um, but this is where you know, team and execution matters. And uh, this is around the time before like, all the internal drama like, spilled over onto Twitter, but uh, among people in the community, it was, there were warning signs that um, the Sushi DAO was starting to have like, some like, Game of Thrones-esque politics of like, people trying to throw wrenches in like, other people's proposals, like fighting for control over the multi-sig treasury, like, trying to you know, embezzle money from the treasury. And, like, there's always money leaving the Sushi DAO like, every month, and like, no one knows like, who these addresses are and like, why they're being used. Um, and that ultimately like, spilled over to Twitter when you know, Mox Maki got forced out, uh, and then people started uh, airing each other's dirty laundry. Um, so at, at the end of the day, um, like if, if you if you want to have a successful project, like these are just like the fundamentals. Like you need to have a product um, that people love. That you're still like innovating on the product. You're just not simply being a fast follower and copying what's already working out there. Like um, there's a, uh, this is also a concern I have with. Like copycats on other L1s is yes, it's like the most obvious idea to copy like an Uniswap AMM or like an Ave on this other L1, um, but usually like that 
hype like dissipates pretty quickly, and to like survive, you still need to innovate on product. And like these um, copycats also tend to attract um, mercenary founders over missionary founders. And you know we're seeing this especially now, where like a lot of the mercenary founders who got into crypto and I have like I just made a quick copycat um, are now actually you know pivoting away and like either going back to college um, going back to their cushy like web 2 Google job um, or they're just like going to like um, the next shiny VC chain um, and like getting a lot of um, incentives to build there um, so these are like three things I think that matter uh, when looking at dune graphs and like what's important uh, to have a sustainable project long term um, great, so hot takes. Um, so I have two hot takes. Um, this is just like from like just interesting trends that I've noticed from like kind of looking through dune graphs and like stuff I've made that I think is like relatively under the radar or just I think things that are like overhyped. Um, so the first uh, hot take, this is my alpha leak that I tweeted uh, a few days ago. Um, so I always had a, I, I guess a lot of you will probably disagree with me on this, but I always had a suspicion that uh, aggregators were overhyped. Um, and it was until I made this dune graph, then you can see like, how much market share uh, and volume is still going directly to like, underlying exchanges uh, versus aggregators. And I think my thesis for that is aggregators like, really make sense when the market is like, super fragmented. Um, but when the underlying market is like winner take most, winner take all, duopoly take all, uh, then people will still predominantly use uh, the underlying marketplace. And um, it just becomes like a nature of habit, and you're not really getting a better price execution on an aggregator. Um, so you can see these, uh, this like, trend across three um, different verticals. So for DEXs, um, you know, DEX aggregators are about 20 to 25 percent of market share, and that's surprising to me given how DEXs have been around since 2018. And like, you'd expect the DEX market to be like pretty fragmented now, given there's so many DEXs out there. But you know, Uniswap is still like 60, 70 percent market share of all DEXs, and like, as a result, um, you know, either front ends like will integrate the Uniswap contracts directly rather than the aggregator contract, or like. Um, use, retail users uh, will just like continue using the uh, Uniswap interface because it's just the nature of habit, and they're not getting like, necessarily a better price from routing to an aggregator and seeing like what other exchange I should use. Um, same with NFTs. Is like OpenSea is about 93% market share for NFTs. Um, I guess a lot of people, uh, when people were talking about uh, Gem and Genie and like talking about how this is an aggregator. I thought aggregator was a misnomer for Gem and Genie. I, I thought of those products more as like, like a pro trader tool for like professional, like I guess more sophisticated uh, NFT traders, um, and like that was, um, I guess a big reason why OpenSea acquired uh, Gem is like to build OpenSea Pro, um, just like more advanced trading tools, like being able to sweep floors, um, better adjust uh, listings uh, for like. The high volume traders who like account for uh, it's like a handful of traders that account for like 80 percent of volume of open seats, um, and like that's the, really the value prop that uh, Gem and Genie brought uh, to NFTs. Uh, not so much of like aggregating like open sea looks rare, uh, X 2 Y 2 and other um, NFT marketplaces. And I guess the, the last vertical would be bridges. Um, so Hop is uh, Hop. Uh, this is more specifically for uh, Ethereum ecosystem bridge, so like L1 to L2 plus like Polygon, and like within the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, Hop is about 73% market share of like bridge volume, um, and aggregators for bridges is still around like 5% or less um, volume, like of the order flow that goes through bridges, um, and like I think a large reason is because like the Hop UI is really nice and you know people just are willing to route through Hop rather than like um, route through an aggregator that has a routing contract. And I actually think uh, in the case of bridges, uh, aggregators actually add more complexity and more smart contract risk um, because um, I guess an example would be when um, Lee Finance got hacked, uh, it was like an infinite token approval um, bug in their router contract. And like that wouldn't have happened if they just integrated the Hop uh, contracts directly rather than add this extra smart contract layer and extra smart contract risk on top of the underlying bridges. 
Um, so that's my first uh, hot take. Um, my second one is uh, on like NFT financialization. So uh, what's interesting, so this is a graph of NFT Phi, and uh, I think what's interesting is, um, well, two things. One is like they had a pretty much a perfect uh, hockey stick graph like uh, up until like the last, uh, up until like this recent um, bear market. And like by perfect, I mean like literally every month was a new all-time high in volume. Um, and even like when the bear market uh, came, like the drawdown from all-time high for uh, NFT Phi was only like 57% versus OpenSea, which was uh, close to 90. So this goes to show that um, NFT collateralized borrow and lending is like much more anti-fragile uh, than a marketplace business model like you know, OpenSea, SuperRare, and like other marketplaces. And you know, my thesis for this is um, like there there are use cases for NFT financialization in like both bull and bear markets. So in bull markets, if you're a holder of a blue chip like punks, apes, uh, you want liquidity and leverage, and that's why you would use a protocol such as this. And in a bear market, uh, NFT collateralized lending behaves more like put options, where you have downside protection um, in case like the floor price crashes. So for example, if you um, collateralize board apes at, um, say, 80 ETH, and like now the floor price of apes is like in the 60s, uh, then uh, you would have had like locked in like, um, it would have been basically like a stop loss for you, uh, where like you effectively uh, sell your board ape at 80 ETH uh, when uh, you get liquidated. Um, so those are um, my two hot takes. Um, and I guess last thing, uh, <laughs> so, I'm just 300 stars short of the flippening, so uh, I implore all of you to like pull out your phones right now and smash that star button so we can have the flippening by the end of day today. All right. Cool. Um, now we have time for Q&A. Uh, I think we have microphones being passed around. Hi, Richard. Yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, like, I was actually looking also into NFT functionalization and wondered what your take is on, I guess, the next thing there. Like, what do you see is still missing? What would you like to see? Yeah, um, let me think. Um, I guess uh, really for, um, like, peer to pool, so, like, what's worked so far is uh, peer to peer, like, lending and borrowing, and like, that works well because it's just, uh, you isolate the counterparty risk to, like, to just like, one lender. Um, but in order for Peter Pool to like, really work well, like, you need um, like, a really good oracle. Uh, and kind of the oracle layer of like, NFT prices is still like, very nascent. Um, there aren't like, that many great like, NFT appraisal projects. Um, we're invested in one called Deep NFT Value that uh, works really well for punks. Uh, but you basically, you need to have a really good price data first before you can worry about uh, doing liquidations. And I think that was the issue that you know, Ben Dow ran into, is like they were uh, too aggressive on um, kind of the LTV uh, and like basically didn't give themselves enough margin of, of, of like safety, uh, which is why they ended up with bad debt. Uh, so like basically, a better price data uh, is like needed for like peer-to-pool NFT-like lending to really work off. Thank you. Do you think we will ever get to like a point where we can value individual NFTs, or will it always happen on like the floor price, basically? Uh, so like deep NFT value, they actually value like individual NFTs like based on traits. So like uh, if you have like an alien punk or like a zombie punk, uh, ape punk, like it will have a different appraisal than just like the floor. Thanks. Hey, Richard. I'm uh, Stefano. I uh, do growth at MetricsDAO, and I just wanted to ask you about, uh, you showed the NFT aggregators versus marketplaces, mm -hmm. and you also showed that 
uh, not just actually the NFT market, but most of those markets have one dominant player uh, versus a fragmentization of that market. Uh, so I have two questions. Why do you think that is and whether that will change or not in the future? Yeah, so like I think specifically for NFTs, um, like UI UX is like much more important than the smart contract layer. And I think that's what why OpenSea was really hard to fork and vampire attack is I mean, like, they were basically on, like, the same smart contracts, the Wyvern contracts, since 2018. Um, and, like, it was only until Seaport recently that they finally upgraded a contract to, like, better trading, like, execution. But uh, the reason people kept going to OpenSea and, like, over Rarible and, like, other marketplaces that existed is just, like, the front end search and discovery filter. And, like, all of that really has to be done manually, that OpenSea really built a defensible moat from doing that. Um, and, like, that's really hard to fork and replicate um, versus kind of an open source smart contract. So I think specifically for NFTs, like marketplaces, it's much more of a defensible moat and like a winner take all market than uh, something more like, um, NF like DeFi projects where uh, it's kind of a permissionless smart contract system uh, that the defensible state is really like TVL, uh, which you could uh, try to vampire attack that away. Hey, Richard. Uh, thanks for your talk. This is Dhruv. Um, you talked about tokenomics and, one th and the pyramid scheme tokenomics. And one thing you mentioned was, well, the way you figured that out is if it goes down to zero. But I guess, how do you figure that out before it goes down to zero, like when it's going up? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm not a trader, so like, I don't know how to time these tops. Um, so like, like Axie, I just like stood by the side and like watched it. I mean, same with like Olympus Dow and like all these others. Um, but yeah, that's a better question to ask, like, Suzu from Three Arrows. <laughs> He's missing. Hi. So I wanted to ask you about your personal view on the evolution pathway of the ecosystem. I mean, at which point in time um, do we, like, stop forking or stop copying the existing mechanisms of finance or whatever business model there is in real life, and at which point in time do we need to actually start looking at projects which like completely break out of a mold? Like for example, uh, perps, options is basically just, uh, you know, repackaging things that are existing. But we have things like flash loans which were created and uh, are products or like things that are being deployed on crypto but don't exist in real life. So at which point in time um, are we going to see the divergence where crypto actually innovates in terms of product creation that can't uh, or have no uh, existence in traditional finance or traditional industries? Yeah, I, I agree that like most of DeFi right now is just kind of copy pasted from TradFi, but like uh, I'd say like over time, like even in the past, like there are like some major innovations that crypto has done that like don't exist in TradFi. So, you know, you brought up flash loans. I say AMMs is like another one is like if you had to like count like what are the top five like innovations that are unique to crypto don't exist in TradFi, Web2, elsewhere. I say AMMs is one. Um, so like, you know, you started with the very basic, you know, Uniswap V1, V2, X times Y equals K AMM. Uh, and then now there's just like a plethora of like research papers of like better AMM designs, like you know capital efficient AMMs uh, that are kind of hybrid AMM order book, uh, which is like Uni V3, um, or even like um, constant function market makers with like replicating market makers, uh, like what primitive uh, finance is doing is basically you can like replicate the payoff of a derivative, like an option through a spot market AMM, and like this is like some brand new research that like never existed in TradFi. Um, so like, I guess if you're, if you're looking at like, what's coming out of research in terms of like, AMMs, like, new cutting edge stuff, um, I think that's where a lot of the innovation is happening in crypto. Um, I say Z ZK, stu ZK stuff is another area um, in terms of like, um, ZK EVM, like the design space and trade-off between scalability and EVM compatibility, like what's the optimal trade-off and like, ZK hardware, like ASICs for zero knowledge proofs that's still like a very new area that um, there's a lot of stuff being done there.